tonight our topic is five ways to prevent cheating in online courses, which is also part of our EdTech Du Jour Professional Development To Go series. And now Dr. Heather Formakis will share a brief presentation and we will open the floor for discussion. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time to uh, join us this evening for our webinar. As Dr. Callback uh, mentioned, this is part of our EdTech Du Jour Professional Development To Go series. So this is our premier webinar and what better topic to discuss than cheating in online courses. We also will have a tweet chat available if you are interested at the hashtag EdTechDujour, which is located on the bottom left-hand side of my screen. So if you are interested in participating in a tweet chat, please feel free to go ahead and use that hashtag. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to do this brief presentation, and then following the presentation, we will open up the floor for further discussion. So EdTech Du Jour is not only a webinar, but we have a YouTube channel as well where we're going to be producing a web series on professional development, anything related to online learning. Tonight, I will be joining you, Dr. Heather Farmakis, along with my colleague, uh, Dr. Melissa Kulbach. Both of us work as directors of academic services or academic partnerships. And we also have uh, adjunct experience in higher education. And again, here is hashtag. So let's begin with debunking the myths. Um, everybody in, in this online field is thinking that online courses are just rampant with cheating because you don't have that face-to-face -face contact. And certainly that's understandable because people are uh, feeling that this is new. A lot of courses are moving from traditional uh, platforms to an online platform. And so naturally there's a lot of mystery in that and what, what it will look like. But recently enough, uh, there was a study done in 2010 in the Online Journal of Distance Learning Administration found that there was not that much of a significant difference and there were 635 undergraduates that were part of this study. So it was a significant study and, and the findings were, were really intriguing to me. Um, and this study goes on to talk about ways uh, that we can not influence cheating behavior, so understanding the reasons behind it and what we can do as professors and people in the industry for online courses can do to prevent that. And there's a citing there if anybody would like to read the full article. I, I definitely recommend it. I saw this on the cover of the Scientific American Mind at one of my most recent airport uh, visits. And this is, this is an interesting cover, especially considering that I had an upcoming webinar on online cheating. And I thought, how apropos. So we have why we cheat. So deceit is part of what makes us human, but what can we win? How, but what can win over our blood? Uh, we just had this with uh, Lance Armstrong, uh, the most noted cheater so far, with how he's admitted to cheating and, and the consequences he's had to suffer for that. And people are cheating in all kinds of things in life, so what would stop from one platform to the next? Obviously, ways to prevent it, but let's look into the reasons why students are cheating. Obviously, for convenience, uh, sometimes it's easier to cheat than to actually get assignments. Uh, pressure to succeed. So, for example, a student can be on academic probation. They could have low GPA, as mentioned in the third bullet, and they don't have a choice. So instead of actually doing the assignments or getting the learning out of what the instructor has facilitated the student, they feel it may be simpler to go ahead and cheat. So also setting up unclear expectations and then the lack of study skills. So meaning that maybe students are not prepared in how to study. So you could have a student 
that has been in school quite some time ago and going back to further their education and not understand how to take notes and have poor planning on their part. Or they could just be um, not prepared for an online course because online courses do require some self-directed learning on the student part. So it's very important to take note of why they are actually cheating. Uh, this is very interesting. There was a recent uh, Chronicle of Higher Education blog, and this talked about MOOCs and teaches how to cheat in online courses with eye to eye prevent with an eye to prevention. So basically, this is a MOOC that Mr. Bernard Bull, who is the Assistant Vice President for Academics at Concordia University in Wisconsin, he's developed this MOOC and capped it at a thousand, and he expects. Uh, those participants to be university professors, and the MOOC is entitled Understanding Cheating in Online Courses. So in this MOOC, he actually assigns everybody to cheat, and then, of course, to disclose how they cheat and why it was easy for them to cheat, and the reasons behind it, and maybe some suggestions on how to work around that. If you go ahead and you read this article, if you click on this Prezi later, You'll find this wonderful quote in this article, and I will just go ahead and read it. It's, I hope that the course helps us realize that we all play a role in helping reduce this. It's not just students changing their behaviors, but all of us learning how to redesign learning environments. So I think he has something very key to say here. How do we redesign learning environments? So with the introduction of online learning, what can we do to help facilitate learning and curb the cheating. So we have five ways to prevent cheating in online courses. The first, of course, is to get to know your students. So once you understand your students' behaviors, you're able to determine if they're going down the wrong path. Also, it'll help establish a rapport and build relationships, so the likelihood of them cheating will be reduced. Additionally, you should educate your students about academic honesty and then the consequences if they break that trust. So, for example, many are not aware of plagiarism and the different forms of plagiarism. And also you have to be aware of all of the different paper mills that are out there. I mean, there's term papers that students can go and purchase. So a way that you can work around that is to make your assignments very clear. Uh, and with certain resources you may want to include with them. For example, you have a certain structure you want to follow with your term paper. They have to include X, Y, Z resources in order for the paper to be evaluated properly with your rubric. So if you make some parameters there, you have a lot of opportunity to reduce that cheating. Also maintaining security. So for example, if you're doing an assessment online, you wouldn't go ahead and put all of the questions out there. You would randomize your questions, randomize your answers, and instead of putting all of the questions right on that one page, that maybe you would pose one question per page so the student wouldn't be aware of the next question. So securing your test bank is also very, very important. I love this one, exploring alternative assessments. So there definitely is a need to have many assessments and have multiple choice, that's certainly understood. But exploring alternative assessments is especially project-based learning where students are submitting chunks of a larger project every week and then a culminating project at the end of the course. Those reduce uh, cheating in the, in the class. Also controlling the environment of, of what is available in that online course and, and the appropriate behavior of, of what is going on in your online course as well. Another way to do it is controlling the environment is not to have your questions that easily Googled. So when you are developing your questions, you want to make sure they're not easily Googled, go ahead and put your question in Google and see how quickly you'll come up with an answer. So you want to kind of think a little bit deeply with what you're going to develop as far as your assessments are concerned. 
And all of that will help you control that environment and prevent cheating in your online class. Besides the five ways that the professor can help reduce cheating, we also have tools to detect and prevent cheating online. For example, there's plagiarism detection software such as Turnitin, where a university or a professor would subscribe to this software online. They would turn in uh, the papers that the students have submitted, and the software will come back with a percentage of uh, plagiarism that, it, that was assessed. Also, there's a browser lockdown feature where the student could be taking an online assessment and cannot log into any other browsers or open up anything like that while they're taking an assessment online. And also, there's keystroke pattern recognition that is able to determine the actual keystroke punching on the keyboard of the student to determine is this student really the student that is responding or is this somebody else. So, it's pretty advanced, all the different tools and technologies that we have available. And please be sure to follow us on our faculty eCommons page. Here you will find other resources for upcoming webinars. Uh, we have a Learn with Michelle uh, webinars and Google Hangouts. We have EdTech Du Jour, which we have our Twitter station and our YouTube channel and you're able to follow us with that, as well as webinars and our web show. So please be sure to go ahead and follow that. And that is the end of this presentation, so I'd like to go ahead and open it up for discussion at this point. Do most LM have a feature where you can use uh, polls of questions like you were describing? Do most LMSs have a feature to use polls? Test polls. You said use randomized questions? Oh, yes. Uh, most learning management systems do have the availability and functionality to randomize the questions as well as the answers to those questions. You can also limit the time a student takes to do that assessment in many LMSs. It's a common feature. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to ask about Turnitin. Pardon me? I wanted to ask about Turnitin. I'm sorry, I didn't make up turn that Turn it in. She's asking about turn it in. Oh, turn it in. Yes, ma'am? Uh, I haven't found um, acceptable percentages, especially in, in research papers where students are quoting um, their sources, what, what have you seen would be an acceptable percentage um, from the Turnitin um, computations? I think that varies because they're definitely going to have some, uh, as long as they're quoting it, um, uh -huh. you're not going to want like an entire paper, obviously, quotes of something, Correct. but you're going to certainly want it referenced. And I think it would matter the type of paper that they're turning in. Is it a, is it a research paper? Are they doing a literature review? Is, to, is this just um, a reflective paper and they're citing other sources? So I think it would depend on the kind of paper that they were submitting and the amount, uh, the percentage amount that you're willing to accept with that. So for example, if it was a reflective paper and they were citing some resources that uh, supported their view, then obviously you would want a lower percentage for that. But if it was a research paper, you wouldn't want, for example, full-on quotes of something where they'd have big line blocks out, but you would definitely expect a higher percentage of your paper uh, being cited. I'd like to add, um, there is a feature in Turnitin where you can set um, what you want to be detected, and you can uncheck um, various elements. But typically in most programs, what I've seen is anything less than 20%. And some people might automatically think, wow, that's 20% that's of a paper that could possibly be plagiarized. But if you've 
uh, seen the Turnitin results, it tells you exactly which portion it flagged. And if it has quotes, it's real obvious to see, oh, that was a quoted source. Um, the other thing to be aware of with Turnitin is if a student submits a paper to turn it in to check the ratio and then they turn it in again, it will say 100%, but it would say it turned in by XYZ student, the same student, you know, a couple mm -hmm. days previous. So um, some of those software plagiarism uh, detection programs have really good um, analytics and it's very easy to see where those percentages are being pulled from. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a, a question or just really would like some input regarding test banks. You know, in some um, disciplines, uh, instructors may say it's okay if you have a test bank, you can use that for practice. And in some disciplines, we guard our test banks. So what uh, do I need to know regarding test banks? I know students can purchase them. Right, so if, you, if you're aware that they're easily purchased, maybe you wouldn't want to weight, include that with a heavy weight in your final grade. So if they wanted to just use it as like an assessment for themselves and they cheated, <laughs> for example, then that, that onus is on them. So I would, I would limit the percentage of how you're weighing those types of quizzes in your class if you know that that information it, is accessible very easily and readily. I know that some professors also, if you know there are test banks that you can purchase, they may purchase those and then when they formulate their questions, you know, they kind of look at the guides that are out there and they seek questions that won't be so easily answered from the test banks. And a lot of times uh, students are getting very wise. So for example, if you have a required textbook for your course, the students are figuring out, oh, if I go to the publisher of that textbook, I can easily get all of the resources that the professor has. So any quizzes or projects or questions, case studies with the answers to them, anything like that, they can get that information. Um, so that's just something to be very cognizant of as well, besides the test banks. I did uh, a little experiment in one of my online courses. Can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can hear you, thank you. Good. Uh, I'm sitting here with my cell phone and my iPad, so I, I can't, <laughs> uh, I don't know if, if you can hear me. And uh, it was absolutely stunning, the change that happened. Uh, there was a, an essay question in Teach uh, Eastern Religions. This was an Eastern Religions course online. And uh, traditionally, when I ask this essay question, students use, they try to paraphrase, but they don't quite make it. And so they end up uh, quoting a lot of material from the text and not putting quotation marks around it. And uh, they get lower grades as a result. So this semester, what I decided to do was to add some instructions to say something like this. For some reason, it's really tempting to simply uh, quote from the book without using quotation marks and went on to explain that a little bit and say you re what I'm really looking for is not a poor paraphrase or simply a quotation from the book. I already know what the book says. But what I'm really looking for is in your own words to express the idea that you're reading about. It was a stunning change. Rather than essay after essay after essay having poor paraphrases uh, and as a result lower grades. Uh, students, uh, almost all of them, really tried to express these ideas in their own words, not just a poor paraphrase. It was stunning. So what I think I learned was that uh, if I help students with uh, additional instructions, it's not a punitive sort of thing, but I'm but I'm anticipating what what they're just about to do, and I'm saying now you don't want to go there. You want to do this other thing. It was remarkable. Uh, would you like to comment on that? It was just an interesting way of of 
um, eliminating a whole lot of, of poor paraphrasing or plagiarism. I definitely agree, and that was one of the um, preventions that I had mentioned tonight. So you set a clear expectation. So when students have yeah. unclear expectations, they will do the most convenient, easier, softer way and thing to do. If they have clearer expectations, which is what you have provided with your assignment details, you've set clear parameters. They understand they don't want to quote. You want it in their own words. So by establishing this up front, you are going to reduce and prevent the cheating of just copying a, a quote from the book. So I think that is a, a definitely a best practice in, in preventing cheating and, and establishing uh, a good rapport and, and a positive learning experience for the students. And it also yeah, cuts down on, I, on the questions that you get in emails as well. So I'm sure that reduced how do I do this, what do I do, by setting it up initially, they took the ball and ran with it. Yeah, I felt like I was working with my students because I knew right what they're thinking, and, uh, and I was anticipating that, rather than reading their essay and then exerting some kind of punitive measures. It was great, great experience. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. There's all kinds of resources you can find on facultyecommons.org. And if anybody's interested, we have a newsletter to subscribe to on facultyecommons.org. So please go ahead and check that out. Do we have any further questions for this evening? No, thank you. It was very informative. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We certainly appreciate your time, and I really enjoyed this collaboration with all of you. And I hope to see you, you soon at another webinar. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye -bye.